American Meteorological Society's policy program is supported in part by a public-private partnership. So our third and final speaker is Dr. Sarah Gaitchis. She's a research fishery biologist with the Ecosystem Assessment Program at the NOAA Northeast Fisheries Science Center. She is a member of the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council's Scientific and Statistical Committee and the New England Fishery Management Council's Ecosystem-Based Fishery Management Plan Development Team. She's also collaborated with many international and U.S. scientists on the design and implementation of integrated ecosystem assessments. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, and thanks for coming out this afternoon. And uh, I probably want to get to the right slide here. So the first question I have for everybody is, who's ever been fishing? Anyone? Yeah, good. That's what I thought. OK. A lot of people understand fishing. So when you went fishing last time, did you get what you were looking for? And did you get it where and when you thought you were going to get it? And if so, you must have had a pretty good forecasting system, all right? So I'm going to talk a little bit about fisheries, and I'm sure everyone in some way is familiar with fisheries, but I'm going to start off by just with a blanket statement that fisheries are very diverse. Just in my experience as a fishery biologist, I've worked with folks all the way from someone like this gentleman right here who fished gill nets in Chesapeake Bay by hand from a skiff, often by himself, sometimes with just one other person. And so he would go out in a very small boat. A few years later, I was actually on this vessel, which is the American Triumph, fishes for Bering Sea Pollock up in the Bering Sea. This vessel can have about 50 crew members aboard, has a processing plant on board, can stay at sea for several months at a time. And um, so obviously they operate under very different conditions and they're targeting very different things. They fish very different gear. Another vessel I've been aboard here is diverse in that it both fished for Bering Sea Pollock as a catcher boat, fished for crabs in the Bering Sea, probably seen the deadliest catch, right? Um, so that's, they're, they're a bit crazy, those guys. They, and uh, also, it, was, it served as a chartered vessel for scientific surveys in Alaska. So these, these vessels can do a lot of different things, and they can fish a lot of different gears. For instance, this boat right here fished crab pot gear, surface trawls, and bottom trawls, all especially scientific bottom trawls for us. There's also things like long line gear here. I haven't been on a long line vessel recently, but I was off Virginia as part of my master's program. So there's a lot of different gear types out. You'll hear me mention them. The long line is, is literally a line with a bunch of hooks on it. It can be fished in the surface or at the bottom. The gill net is what you see right here. It's basically a wall that fish get caught in. Both of these vessels fish trawls, like I said, so the large net towed behind the boat. And so there's this huge variety, and that's just me. There's, there's lobster pots, there's scallop dredges, there's many, many different types of kinds of fishing gear. And also, there's recreational fishing, which takes many different forms. So they're incredibly diverse. But the one thing they have in common is they're all affected by changing weather patterns. So uh, just like the two industries we've heard about here, the changes in weather can really affect um, both the decisions that people are making when they decide to plan for either the day or the season or the next couple of years, and it can also affect their results when they're out on the water, and that can affect markets, and it can affect economies and coastal communities. So what I'm showing here is basically the chain reaction, whoops, sorry, of uh, if you go from, say, large-scale changes in temperature or precipitation or carbon dioxide across the globe, this results in changes in ocean temperature or sea ice, sea level, the amount of fresh water entering the system, the ocean chemistry, all of which changes the ecology of the system for the animals that live there. And what I work on is in the circle there. I'm a biologist, so I work on a lot of the biological impacts to fish, which, inclu which include changes in productivity, changes in phenology, a fancy word for timing. So again, when do they um, lay their eggs? When do they encounter their food? When do they migrate? How, much, how many of them actually survive to the next season? 
species distribution is a big one, and I'll show you a map in a minute of how that's changing. And al also, all of this results in changes in species abundance and in community composition, which then results in changes in the ecology, how the fish are interacting with each other. This is what fishermen are facing right now. And this uh, then, in turn, has big effects on social and economic factors. It changes how people fish. It changes their revenues. It changes coastal economies, industries, subsistence use. There's, there's interactions all across the board here. So it's incredibly important to understand how weather patterns are right now and how they might be changing in the short-term future as well as the long-term future. So I'm going to show you one example of how species distribution has changed. And this is Atlantic cod here off the coast. And you probably recognize the coast, but you know we're over here somewhere. And so there's Cape Cod, New York, Long Island, New Jersey, the Delmarva Peninsula. This up here is the Gulf of Maine. And so what you're seeing is the amount of Atlantic cod caught on the spring surveys by the Northeast Fisheries Science Center starting in 1968. And red is a lot of cod, and dark blue is pretty much no cod. I think this is kilograms per, per tow or something like that. But the dark red is basically four times as much cod as, as the blue. Okay? And so you see that they were distributed in the late 60s. Um, there's some of them down here off the coast. The main part of the distribution is up here on George's Bank and in the Gulf of Maine. And so now I'm just going to show you an animation of this year by year up through 2014. And this is just from our surveys. And you can see a lot of these movies right here on our website. So let's see if I can get this to run. So you're looking at the changes over time. And I think one thing to notice is, first of all, that distribution down here off the mid-Atlantic is starting to shrink a little bit. And the cod are starting to concentrate. By the 90s, they're pretty much only on George's Bank and in the Gulf of Maine over there near Boston and Gloucester. By the time you're in the 2000s, the distribution's really shrunk. And then when you get up to about 2014, there isn't even any red anymore. So the distribution's really shrunk down a lot. It's moved to the north. These fish are very affected by ocean conditions, OK? It's not just fishing. I'm sure you've heard about fishing for Atlantic cod in the northeast. There is a lot of fishing on them. But they're also incredibly affected by the environmental conditions. And it's basically our job to tease apart the two and help advise the fisheries on how to operate under these changing conditions. So. I was at a meeting just yesterday with some fishermen f figuring out ecosystem-based management procedures for, for New England. And I had a fisherman there, and I said, was going to this briefing. And he, he said uh, that, well, yeah, of course we need seasonal forecasts. So end of briefing. But I'm still going to show you a couple of examples of how this might work. And I'm sorry, I'll make sure to get your question. Um, so there's, there's um, Fishermen can use this type of information all the way from individual decisions made about where to go today up through decisions about products and how many processors to have in hand capacity, exactly the same sort of things in the energy and agriculture industry, all the way through to the science and how do we predict what the catch should be for next year. So I'll show you three examples here. The first one is fairly simple. Where should I fish today? And so now the map that you're seeing is the Pacific north of Hawaii, and the red is actually warmer water temperatures except for this red band here in the middle. And the, these are cooler temperatures and warmer temperatures. And this red band here in the middle is the temperatures between 63 and a half and 65 and a half degrees. Now, why would I care about that if I'm a fisherman? Longline fishermen are targeting swordfish in this region. However, there are also sea turtles in this region. And sea turtles like to eat bait just as much as anything else. And nobody wants to catch sea turtles, believe me. The fishermen do not want to catch sea turtles, most of all because if they get a certain number of sea turtles, their fishery will shut down. And in the mid-2000s, this actually, they approached their limit. And so uh, colleagues at the Pacific Islands Fishery Science Center looked into what temperature ranges the turtles tended to be caught in and what their preferred habitat was. And they developed this product that fishermen can go to a website and look at this red band here. This temperature range is where about half the turtle bycatch interactions occur. And so they can use this type of map to make decisions about where to or not to go fishing in order to try to avoid this type of bycatch. It's not 100% foolproof. This is also not a forecast, but this is current conditions, which that alone um, often is difficult to get into fisheries management and decision making. So this is a really nice product. This product is also still active and went to the website on Friday, and there's the map right now. So it's a lot warmer right now, and there's no band on it. There's also no swordfish fishery right now. So this is a very seasonal thing happening here. But this is an example of how this type of information can help with individual decision making. 
So then there's also kind of planning for the season type of, of decisions that need to be made. And I'm sure many of you have heard of the Gulf of Maine lobster fishery, probably have had Gulf of Maine lobster. I think uh, some, the large majority of lobster eaten in the United States comes from the Gulf of Maine. And this fishery was recently certified by the Marine Stewardship Council as sustainable, part of it, and the other part of it is under assessment. Catches are at record highs in 2014. It was the highest catch they've ever had. Some enormous amount of the coastal economy of Maine is based on lobsters right now. Um, so it's a success story in New England. So what happened in 2012? In 2012, the short story is a lot of product came to market earlier than normal, a couple months earlier than normal. The bottom dropped out of the prices. The processors were completely overwhelmed. They couldn't handle all the product. Lobster is a live product. You can't just stick it on a shelf and wait for later. It has to be processed right away or it's not worth anything. So basically, there was a, a big glut of product on the market. The pri prices fell through the, the basement and the fishermen couldn't make enough money to even operate. Um, now, this is a huge problem. There was plenty of lobster around, but the problem was the timing. And the reason for the timing was because they came in shore early and molted and all walked into the traps that were waiting for them, and so they were all picked up and taken to shore. Um, could this early molt have been predicted? Well, yeah, it was predicted, actually. Um, so the first headline I showed you was dated July 2012. This headline is dated March 29th, 2012, if you can't read it, and that is a guy surfing in Maine in March. This is unusual, okay? Um, the water temperatures were well above normal as early as March in the Gulf of Maine, and this was, there was a lot of evidence of this. The 2012 turned out to be the warmest year on record in the Gulf of Maine, and that area is warming faster than 99% of the world's oceans right now. And in this article, it even said, this could cause lobsters to molt early and move inshore <laughs> early. What it didn't say was, and that will cause the processors to be overwhelmed, and that will cause the bottom to fall out of the market. So that's the piece that we're missing, and it is a communication issue similar to, I think, some of the issues brought up in agriculture. But um, some folks at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute said, hey, maybe we can develop a forecast product here. So I encourage you to look at their website because they have started to look at can we use ocean temperatures in March to predict whether it's going to be an early season or a late season for the lobster industry. If we can predict an early season, maybe the processors can bring on additional capacity or maybe a fishermen can plan to spread out their season a little bit more or people can just in general plan for a more efficient season and one that doesn't damage the economy quite as much if there's this early type of season. Um, in addition to this type of project, there's, there's probably a need for forecasting to get additional information at the right scale. So this very, is also very similar to the agriculture example. And one of the projects that we've been doing at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center is a lot of cooperative research with the fishermen themselves. And this is an example of a program that's been ongoing for a couple of years where environmental monitors are actually put on the lobster traps in cooperation with the fishermen. And so they're collecting oceanographic data now. There's a lot of lobster traps in the Gulf of Maine, a lot of them. And they're in regions where a lot of the surveys can't get to, either because they're very shallow or inaccessible or otherwise you know, not places where we normally survey. So this is a chance to start incorporating a lot of information from the fishery in real time to maybe make some more of these now casts or even short-term forecasts that can help with decision making and the processing industry's decisions as well as possibly management. From here, I'm going to go to uh, an, the last example, which is even more of a science question, perhaps, and would bring in some of this type of increased monitoring that we're seeing here. One of the decisions that we have to make on the scientific and statistical committees with the fishery management councils is to look at stock assessments and to say what should be the allowable catch quota for next year but also two years out. And the reason for this is a lot of councils operate with these advanced specifications. And so this is a way that they can basically allow the industry to plan for what's coming down the pipe. And at the last meeting that we just had in July, well, sorry for the table, but we came up with these um, specifications for three fish, summer flounder right there, scup, and black sea bass. And so we had to do 2016 as well as 17 and 18 for a couple of them, and we did 16 and 17 for black sea bass. Two things to notice here. First, there's a commercial quota and a recreational quota, and that recreational quota is at the same scale as the commercial quota. All of these people are recreational fishers. You see those smiles on their faces? So we manage these fisheries not just for 
seafood, but also for recreational opportunities. And this brings in a much wider array of people participating in the fishery who are interested in how much they would allow, be allowed to catch. And the recreational sector brings in quite a bit of money just from charter vessels and other things in addition to the commercial industry. So if we can do better, in particular, black sea bass, you'll notice this uh, basically cut and paste down for the next couple of years. We don't have a lot of information on some of these species. The assessments don't have the appropriate biological information or sampling all the time to make good predictions two years out. And the question is, can we use information on environmental conditions to improve on these things? So the last example I'm going to show you is a place where maybe we can and maybe we can follow this example in other places. So this, we're back to the Bering Sea again. This is Alaska. And this cartoon here, um, without boring you with too many of the details, just says there's two types of conditions. There's a warm year where the sea ice melts early. You've seen the deadliest catch. It's dark, it's cold, everything's frozen all winter long, right? So in a warm year, that sea ice goes away earlier, right? But it's still a little bit too dark for all the ocean plants to start their bloom. And so the bloom happens kind of late, and it feeds a lot of the other critters that eat those but they, they basically wind up being really small. In a colder year, the ice sticks around a lot longer, and by the time it's gone, the, the phytoplankton, the marine plants, are ready to bloom, and they feed a whole lot more of these guys, and they get a lot bigger. Who cares, really? Come on, these are ocean bugs. Um, who cares is pollock, okay? And that is the largest volume fishery in the country right now. So in a year where there's an early ice retreat that's warm and it feeds a lot of small co copepods, we get an awful lot of small pollock, and that's great until winter comes. They haven't had enough big things to eat, they haven't gotten fat enough, and they either die or their parents eat them. So it's a cruel world out there, but that is what happens. In, these, in the other years, sorry, what you wind up with is a lot of big pollock, and that's not really working right now, but you should see a picture of big pollock there. Basically, they overwinter a lot better, and the incoming year class is a lot stronger in these cooler years with later ice retreat. So it's possible we could use this type of information to improve these one to two year out forecasts if we can work out the mechanisms. In summary, I think what we need to be able to take advantage of these shorter term and longer term seasonal forecasts is we need to continue our observation systems, and we've got a lot of those in place, including surveys and also cooperative research with fishermen. We also need to understand why, so that's that mechanistic research that I just showed you on food webs and things moving around and species interactions and things like that. We need to be able to do forecasting, not just of the weather conditions, but also of the animals. So we're in the business of forecasting fish, and it can get pretty difficult, but we're working on it here. And figuring out how they change with these climate conditions is really important. And the final piece of the puzzle, of course, is what should management do about it? And so we're doing a lot of simulation work right now looking at are there management strategies that would be robust to a lot of these future conditions or when we don't know what is going to happen in the environment? But also, are there ways that we can help communities adapt to these changing conditions? Are there ways that we can provide early warning for processors, for instance, or for fishermen, in, in, and also our scientific products? And I'll just uh, point out that there's places where we're moving beyond what we've observed in the past. And so we really need good forecasts to add into our modeling to figure out what to do next. And I'll direct you to the um, NOAA climate science strategy for some further work on integrating this in our predictions. Thank you very much.